Good afternoon. Welcome to American Bankers Association's webinar on Gremlin Socials, the Banker's Guide to Strategic Social Media. My name is Steve Plastic. I'm with the Endorse Solutions area here at the ABA. We'll get started in just a moment on this program discussing the Banker's Guide to Strategic Social Media, but before we end the program, let me run through some administrative issues. This webinar will run approximately 50 minutes. If any questions at any point, please send them using the Q&A message area. We'll have time after the presentation for a question and answer session. To send a question, in the meeting window, open the Q&A window. Type the message in the Q&A box and please send it to both host and presenter. We'll try to answer all your questions at the end of the presentation. If we can't answer all your questions, we'll get back to you after the webinar is ended. We'll be distributing the presentation to all the attendees tomorrow, Thursday, January 12th. I would also like to note that the ABA endorses Gremlin Social for their social media marketing and compliance solution. Recently, Gremlin earned ABA's endorsement for their social media marketing and compliance solution. Gremlin combines social media management with compliance and ROI tracking tools and makes it easy for banks to master the social media marketing landscape and build business using social networks. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenters, Mickey Ware, Jeff McCarthy, and Heather Colderman. Mickey Ware is a digital marketing director of Gremlin Social. Mickey is a digital marketer with seven years experience in B2B marketing and software as a service. Mickey began her journey with Gremlin Social as a customer and is excited to join the team as content manager in 2004. Currently digital marketing director, Mickey develops and executes integrated web and social media marketing strategies and assists Gremlin clients looking to leverage digital strategies to achieve their business goals. Next, we have Jeff McCarthy, who's the Vice President and Marketing Director at First Bank Financial Center. Jeff currently leads a team at First Bank Financial that manages a broad range of responsibilities, including strategic planning, advertising, sales support material development, building signage, social media strategy and execution, website content management, customer satisfaction measurement, direct mail, public relations, charitable giving, and event planning. With experience both with an ad agency environment as well as in a corporate culture is able to t tackle challenges from multiple angles to arrive at marketing communication solutions that builds brands and attracts customers. Throughout his career, he has worked with clients from a variety of categories. Specifically, he has extensive experience within financial services and healthcare, as well as exposure to other consumer B2B categories. And lastly, we have Heather Coulterman, Senior Marketing Representative at First Bank Financial Center. Heather is a marketing professional with experience in social media, events, and communication. She currently supports the First Bank Center Marketing Director through, through the overall management of the corporate marketing department in the areas of management, planning, and the execution of both short and long business plans and marketing initiatives involving all lines of business for the organization, helping to define and maintain the organization's brand, image, and customer experience. She manages branch events and sponsorships, PR, as well as the bank's social media footprint and initiatives. With that, I'd like to turn the floor over to Mickey, Jeff, and Heather for their presentation. Thanks a lot, Steve, and thanks to everyone for joining us this afternoon. On our agenda today, we're going to start with some assumptions about how much you already know about social media, and then we'll talk about strategic versus ready, fire, aim marketing, what it means and why it doesn't work. After that, we'll get to the meat, how to implement a strategic and focused plan for content and social media. Heather and Jeff are going to talk about their strategy at their bank and the successes that they've had. And then we'll wrap up with key takeaways and questions. So first, let's talk about what you probably already know. We're assuming that most of you on the call know the nuts and bolts of basic social media, how to set up your accounts, posting to your accounts, and of course, the business value associated with social media for banks. If not, that's fine too. Uh, the material that we're going to share today is also valuable no matter what stage that you're at. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Strategy versus ready, fire, aim, content and social media marketing for banks. So we define ready, fire, aim as uh, distributing content on social media before you're really ready, uh, many times based on questionable advice from a social media guru, ninja, or rock star. Um, content and social media marketing is really, really fluid. It changes daily. Uh, just since we started this webinar, something has probably already changed. So uh, really, jumping in before having some kind of a plan in place just doesn't work. 
For example, it's not necessary to be on every single social network. If your customers aren't on Snapchat, uh, you're just going to waste your time, uh, maybe even money, trying to figure out why you're not getting that engagement on Snapchat. Choose the networks that make the most sense for your company. Not having a plan can also be costly in dollars and in time. Like I said, if you're, uh, if you're advertising on social media, obviously if you're advertising to people who aren't interested in your product or your bank, then that's going to be money that you're just kind of throwing out the window. It's critical to put your message in front of the people who actually care about your business. Also, without metrics and measurement, you can't measure success. So how do you know if what you're doing is working if you can't quantify it? Defining key performance indicators and putting metrics behind them provides a roadmap for your social campaigns. And then finally, if you don't know who you're talking to, you don't know what to say. Uh, you need to define your audience, figure out who you're talking to, and refine your message. Define and refine. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about creating personas coming up in the next section. But before we move on, I wanted to throw it to Jeff really quick for some insight on how First Bank Financial Center views strategy at their bank. Jeff? Yeah, I think, you know, those bullet points that you have there are, are really, really important. Um, you know, when I joined the bank three and a half years ago, uh, we had social media, but we didn't have a strategy around social media. So we actually took ourselves off of the social media networks that we were on, kind of took a time out for six to eight months and developed the strategy. And, and when you talk about not all networks being equal, we really researched all the different social networks to identify not only where our customers were, but what networks were most appropriate for the type of content that we wanted to post, um, and then spent, you know, once we identified those, spent a good amount of time putting together the content uh, calendar as well. I know we'll get into that in a little bit as well, but we really established all of that stuff first before we turned social media back on and got really active in it. And I think that that time out suited us very well and led to the success that, that we're seeing today. And, you know, I think that's a really good point that you bring up, too, is that uh, just because you turn it on doesn't mean you can't turn it back off and take that time out, take a step back, and really start to focus, refocus your efforts. Nothing can be undone. <laughs> that, that's true. And really, I mean, active engagement is so important. So if you're not ready to commit the time and resources, um, it, it's best not to be there at all. Right. So then let's get strategic. Let's figure out how we can actually have these focused and strategic social media campaigns. We've got six really great tips that we boiled it down to, um, and hopefully that will help you create a very basic strategy. So tip number one, set goal. The first question you have to ask is, what do we hope to accomplish with social media? Um, our friends at the American Bankers Association took a survey of several hundred banks and found that the top three goals for banks on social are community engagement, deepening existing customer relationships, and brand awareness and thought leadership. Um, so not selling, not new business. Uh, that's interesting to me because I, I think everybody's first uh, idea is, oh, this is going to help us drive business. Now, I think if you achieve these three goals, that will happen through the course of your, uh, your strategy. Um, but so accomplishing those is always important, and, but, and so that selling and that uh, new business, that ROI, are not necessarily the goals that you need to set right up front. What are your thoughts on that, Jeff? Yeah, I absolutely agree. These are the top reasons we are there. You know, for, for people that, that don't live and breathe banking every day like we do, um, they view checking accounts as, as kind of generic across all organizations. So the things that can separate you apart um, from those other banks in, in your footprint are really these things, highlighting these things. Um, highlight your community engagement, highlight your thought leadership, so that when people are looking to, to change a banking relationship, they've had exposure to you, they know what you're all about, um, and that can help tip the, the, the scales in, in your favor. It's, it's a long-term investment not a quick, you know, flip a switch and, and get a, a bunch of uh, new, new accounts or, or customers acquired. Exactly. I always like to say that social media is a marathon and not a sprint, for sure. Absolutely. 
So tip number two, we're going to talk about numbers now. Define your success metrics. From the clients that I have spoken to here at Gremlin, um, metrics are the biggest concern or one of the biggest concerns because you know you need them but aren't exactly why um, to, you know, what to, to, to track, uh, which ones are the most valuable. So the first thing to do is define your key performance indicators. Uh, in a basic strategy, it might be the three that we have here on screen right now, consumption, sharing, and engagement. Uh, consumption metrics, uh, that's how many people are seeing your content, how many eyes are on it. Uh, sharing, how many people are sharing your content with their networks. And engagement, how many people are actually raising their hands and interacting with you online. As your strategy matures, you can certainly add more of these buckets, create as many, meet your needs. Just depends on your business goals. So then some of the numbers around those uh, performance indicators, some of the hard metrics that you want to quantify, uh, you can start with very high-level metrics. Now, these are some for Facebook. And you don't have to start with all of these. Again, it's going to depend on your goals. But at a minimum, you should start with tracking your followers, uh, maybe the number of post shares and the number of actions on your posts, like uh, comments, likes, and reactions. Uh, post clicks are another good one. Any of those three or two or three maybe you can pick are going to provide you with some early value uh, as you get started on your social media strategy. As you get further along, add more metrics that allow you to drill down on content and page performance. So here's an example of how First Bank Financial Center tracks their Facebook metrics. Heather, can you tell us about what we're seeing here? Sure. Uh, at First Bank Financial Center, we frequently use uh, Facebook Insights to track our metrics on Facebook. Um, on Insights, you can view snapshots of your page likes, um, growth, posts, um, reach and engagement. Um, so being that one of the metrics FBFC focuses a lot on is engagement, um, we take pride in that our engagement levels on our social channels compare favorably with bigger banks that have a much larger following. Um, so this screenshot, you know, gives us confirmation that the things that we are posting are the things people want to see from us. So we learned it's not always about the number of people that are following you, um, but the engagement you have with those that are following you. Right, exactly. And engagement as you get further into your strategy can almost become one of the more important metrics because it means that people are actually sharing and uh, interacting with you online. So then Twitter, we have metrics around Twitter. You might track the number of followers on Twitter, uh, the number of retweets, and the number of mentions. Those three would be great initially. Down the road, you can track hashtags, uh, impressions to see how many eyes are on your tweets. And then um, finally, LinkedIn, I'm going to fly through these pretty quick. Uh, LinkedIn, more of the same. Uh, you can uh, track your followers, your shares, likes, and comments to start. And then uh, later on down the road, post clicks, new followers, uh, et cetera, as your accounts gain traction. So again, don't feel like you need to uh, boil the ocean from the very, very beginning. Start with two or three very high-level metrics. Get some idea about how your uh, pages and content are performing, and then build from there. Let's move on to tip number three, developing your team. Uh, most likely, you've got at least one person handling social media right now. Uh, but in the early stages, it's kind of important to decide who's going to be responsible for that content, whether it's going to be you or if you have somebody, um, a writer at house, or maybe even a third party or an agency, um, where are you going to get that content? Will your team members have carte blanche to post, or will there be a moderation and approval process? Who's going to be that approver of those posts? Who handles all of that? And who's going to be the public-facing community manager who handles feedback and questions posted to your social accounts? Uh, and then are you going to train this team? Are you going to train everybody in the bank who will be participating on social media? And are you going to do that in-house or, again, find the resources uh, outside of the bank? Finding the right people uh, to manage all of this is going to be one of your most important tasks. And, Jeff, um, how do you guys manage the uh, content and social at uh, FBFC? What's your uh, team look like and what's your advice for banks for, with smaller teams or larger teams? 
Yeah, we're, we're very fortunate. We're about a, a billion dollar uh, community bank and we have a four person marketing team and Heather really is um, responsible for executing our program. It's one of her primary responsibilities of, of her job here each day. Um, and, and I was fortunate enough, you know, when I talked about taking that, that break from social media, uh, we actually hired Heather during that time with this strategy in mind. It's certainly not all she does for us, but it, it's a primary responsibility. Um, you know, I, I really recommend having one person be that, that go-to person. Somebody's got to own it. Somebody's got to be dedicated to it. Um, and if you are looking to, to outsource it, you know, either, you know, have an, an, an intern do it or an agency do it, the, the challenge really is, is making sure that that person or that firm understands your brand and understands your brand voice. Your, your social media has to be reflective of your culture. And I think a challenge of outsourcing it can be getting somebody who really understands that voice. That, that can be a challenge. Um, you know, the other advantage of, of having somebody on staff, you know, who manages that for you is you're able to be much more responsive and, and able to uh, post things quickly when they arise. We ask all of our branch staffs and, and lenders to provide us with photos and, and information on things that they're doing out in the community. And if, if they get us something at 10 a.m. that they did that morning, we can post it that afternoon and, and, and be really responsive that way. So I guess I would, I would, um, I would lean towards, you know, in-house is best, assuming you can, can afford the time uh, to do so, uh, but certainly keep a close eye and rein on it if you're, if you're going to be outsourcing. Great. Thanks, Jeff, so much. So talking of the positions that you can potentially hire for, um, now, obviously, you don't have to have all of these folks, but uh, just a quick guide to social media hires. Managers and strategists usually work together on planning what your social media looks like, um, what to post, when to post. They probably handle the editorial calendar, et cetera. Uh, the community manager that I mentioned earlier, that's your public-facing team member, the one who is constantly monitoring your accounts for feedback, responding to feedback and questions. Uh, a content manager is the writer in-house. He's the one that's uh, working with the social media team to plan those posts, write any original content pieces that you may produce. And then the content contributor is uh, the writer as well. That's all they do is to write content, maybe blogs, research papers, any long-form content that you'll produce. And then there's the social media intern. Uh, we want to be careful with this one, obviously, but uh, an intern can be valuable if they understand a little bit about each team member, if they understand your bank, um, it, and then they can pinch it wherever it's needed. So again, not necessary to have all of these roles. One or two people can probably manage everything, but nice to have if you can swing it. So tip number four, develop a basic content strategy. Narrow your focus, define your purpose. So when it comes to content, again, don't feel like you have to go all out right up front. Narrow your focus on the customer base that's most relevant to you. Find out where they spend time online so you don't waste time on unnecessary networks. That's what Jeff was saying earlier. They researched, uh, really researched the networks that made sense for them. And then determine who you want to be online by determining your corporate voice. Create a content calendar and then package, distribute, and repurpose your material. And we'll talk about all of those individually here in just a bit. First, I want to go through a few myths that might keep bankers from jumping on the content and social media bandwagon. Uh, first of all, customers don't read content from banks. It's boring. Uh, but a, a couple of studies out there have showed that actually uh, affluent customers, 90%, are not only using social media, almost half of them are using it to interact with their financial institutions. So your customers are there, and they expect for you to be there as well. Myth number two, content and social media marketing, marketing are important for banks. The ABA social media uh, survey showed that nearly half of the respondents consider social media to be important to their banks, and then over half of them plan to increase spending on content and social in the coming year. And Heather, you had some feedback on how uh, role, uh, the role that social media has played at FBFC. 
Uh, sure. Um, our social media program really has brought some great traffic to our website. Um, in fact, we tracked about one-third of those coming to our site from social were first-time visitors. So we use our social media program to also expose people to our brand. So we feel our social program is doing its job if you can introduce new individuals to our website and to our brand as well. Um, so we would basically suggest that, you know, you want to link your posts back to your website. So if you're advertising a toy drive, link it back to your location page where they can drop off the toys, um, things such as that nature. Right. So this number three then, we've got content and social media are too time consuming. Um, that's the biggest, that's the biggest uh, problem for all of us, isn't it? Um, if you have the property, proper strategy, um, maybe an automation tool on there, it's possible, it really is possible for one person to handle social in 15 minutes a week. Um, so anyway, with those out of the way, let's now start back on to our tips. We're still talking about uh, creating customer personas. Who is your audience? So we define buyer personas or marketing personas as fictional generalized representations of your ideal customers. So these are the people that you are really going for. You can have multiple customer personas that you may be talking to, especially if you have different lines of business within the bank. Maybe you've got a mortgage section. Maybe you've got insurance as well. Uh, maybe some financial advisors. So you'll want to create personas for all of those. And you can uh, create your personas based on different criteria. There's demographic information, uh, they're basically name, age, rank, serial number, uh, known pain points. And this is a really good time to get your customer service team involved here. If you have one on staff, go to customer service and say, what are you hearing, um, negative and positive, from our customers? And then use that to create some content that might be valuable to those folks. You can also create a persona uh, based on lifestyle behaviors, uh, hopes and dreams. If you do some market research, whether it's very simple or whether it's very involved, you can create a, a really great overview of the person or persons that you're talking to. And uh, my tip to you is to start with two or three. You know, you may want to start with a very simple, uh, maybe one for banking, one for mortgage, one for financial advisors, All of, if that's all in your bank. Um, and flesh those out as your strategy matures. Here's an example of a customer persona that we created, John Doe, unbanked millennial. He's in his mid-20s to mid-30s. He's married. He's got a college degree. His income is somewhere between 50 and 80K per year. Of course, it could be a lot more depending on where he lives or it could be less. He hasn't used a bank previously, but wants to start building credit for a potential home loan. Uh, and then based on all of that information, oh, he also may or may not have a child. Maybe he's getting ready to start, uh, start a family. So using all of that information, you can build this persona and decide what content would actually speak to John Doe Banks Millennial. Um, so he's a younger guy. Uh, he's interested in a home loan. What can you create that's, what can you do to reach out to him through content? Um, so some examples could be um, tips on how to choose a bank, how to build credit, uh, maybe how to become loan ready, maybe even a picture of a bank customer that you have holding the keys to their first home that they got uh, through a loan uh, with your bank. These are all different ideas that you can leverage based on your personas. So then once you've figured out who you're talking to, you need to find out where they are. Choose the right network. Again, not necessary to be everywhere, especially in the very beginning when you really need to uh, buckle down and, and focus your efforts to try to build your online audiences. Uh, so based on your customer personas, choose one or two, master them, and then scale. Uh, we pulled together here at Gremlin a completely unscientific graph that you see on your screen right now of the networks that we consider valuable and less risky based on just feedback we've gotten from our customers. Uh, you can see Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter kind of leading the pack there for the most business value and the least risk. Uh, Instagram, though, is quickly gaining some traction and probably needs to be a little bit further in the green with the, uh, with the other three. Um, then we've got Snapchat and uh, Pinterest. Pinterest is kind of low risk, but also 
probably not a lot of business value for banks right now. Um, but every, these things can change overnight, like I said. So never say never. But right now, Pinterest is probably not some place that you're uh, going to find a lot of banking customers hanging out. And then Snapchat, which is very big with uh, Gen Z, with kind of the youngins. Um, again, not a lot of business value yet. Um, and it could be a little bit risky because there's the, the live um, nature of it and, uh, you know, things are never actually gone. So we just haven't really found a business value for Snapchat just yet. But you never know. Uh, Jeff, I'm going to uh, call on you now. What kind of networks or what networks have provided the most value at uh, FBSD? Yeah, I think it's an interesting point that you make about this graph that it can certainly vary by organization. Um, we currently are on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube. And really the reason why we picked those four, and, and Instagram and YouTube in particular, along with Facebook, is that most of what we like to talk about on social media is um, our community involvement, our charitable giving, uh, how active we are um, with our customers and sharing their stories. And, and pictures and video just do the best job of, of doing that. They're, they're very engaging. Uh, younger consumers in particular like to consume video content. So we're starting to produce more and more videos with our YouTube channel and, and housing them there. Um, at the same time, to, to one of your other points, we are right now actively evaluating Twitter and Pinterest as possible places to go next. Um, so I, you know, I think that the key here is really, you know, back to one of your original slides, really identifying what your, your, your goals for your, your program are and who you're trying to reach and what the content is that you're going to be pushing out and then picking the most appropriate channel from there. Absolutely, and I'm glad that you brought up the, uh, the video aspect of it. I didn't mention YouTube and G+. Um, G plus right now for us anyway, and, and Jeff, you can chime in to see, to tell me, um, if you found any value in G plus. Very good for SEO. Um, but not a lot of business value that we've seen beyond SEO. Uh, again, that can always change, but, um, G plus is kind of the, the dark horse <laughs> in social media yeah. these days. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, Jeff. we would absolutely agree with your, your SEO per perception there. We would say the same thing. Right, and then YouTube is really, really valuable. Uh, video is huge on really all of the social networks these days. Facebook weights video um, a lot higher than even images at this point. Twitter has gotten into the video game, uh, Instagram as well. So if you can afford it and if you can put it down, um, if you have the time and the resources for it, uh, video is absolutely a, a wonderful addition to your, um, when I was talking earlier about how to get more out of one asset and how we created videos uh, based on our ebook. Um, if you have the resources to do it, absolutely video is a great place. Okay, so determining your voice. Uh, who are you online? How do you want to be perceived? And this is kind of the, um, an intangible one that uh, I don't know that people actually think about when they start getting into content and social media. But it's important to know what you're going to sound like on your social networks. Are you going to be friendly and approachable? Are you more conservative? Um, some questions to kind of ask to flesh that out. Our, uh, our brand personality is or our brand personality is not. We use this type of language. Uh, we try to whatever. Um, for example, we would say or we would not say, and then throw in maybe some notes about uh, your, the culture of your bank and what's important. These are all things that will lend themselves into creating a voice so that you'll use across your social networks and throughout your content. And then, of course, you just make sure that it stays consistent across all platforms and whoever is posting uh, in the name of your brand stays true to that brand voice. So one of the most important tasks what, when you're creating your online uh, strategy is to create a content calendar. Uh, this is a roadmap of content that you can customize that's based on your strategy. Uh, the example that I have here is broken down by its one week's worth of posts, and it has the title of whatever the campaign is, the content type, the offer that you will include with it if there is one, 
the channels where you'll post it, and then the persona that you're trying to reach with your content. So this is a very basic outline. You can certainly customize it based on whatever your, uh, whatever your strategy is. You can plan monthly if you'd like to. You can plan quarterly, whatever works. And I'm going to call on Heather now. Uh, do you have an example of how you guys handle a content calendar at your bank? Sure. So when, uh, when sitting down to create our content strategy for the year, I usually do it month to month. Um, but I don't necessarily schedule content um, for every single day. The reason for this is since, you know, how Jeff kind of mentioned, our branches come to us with information they want us to post day to day. Um, however, I do plan posts that revolve around the holidays or specific events. Um, so planning those out week to week. Um, so for example, we have a contest that runs every Wednesday, so I know I do have a post for every Wednesday. Um, but instead of scheduling each day out, I also found it really handy to have a library of posts, so things such as blogs or images where I can grab from um, if I don't have any posts for that particular day. That's oh, how that's we kind of... Yeah, to, to keep a, a content library of, of pre-approved posts as well. So if you're, this is great if you're going to have other employees joining you too, you can always uh, pre-approve those, have them sitting there, and then if other employees or team members would like to post, then they can grab that content as well. That's a great point. So then package, distribute, and repurpose. Uh, as much, I was talking about time earlier, as much as we'd all like to create Pulitzer Prize winning original content on a daily basis, the reality is most of us just don't have that kind of time. So um, squeeze as much material as you possibly can out of each piece of content that you produce and distribute it across every single one of your platforms, including your company website. Here's an example of something that we did here at Gremlin. Uh, we have our Banker's Guide to Social Media Strategy. It began as a 30-plus page ebook. Uh, the original content uh, was really long form, and we put it out online and uh, put it behind a landing page. And then we, what we did was con condense the original 30-page guide into a blog post. And then after the blog post, we condensed even further to a 30-second video. Uh, we created a tip sheet as well as a handy one sheet reference. And then finally, here we are presenting it to you all on a webinar. So that's five pieces of, con or basically four pieces of content out of one original piece of content. You can also do uh, several other things. You can create podcasts if you've got that kind of bandwidth. You can create infographics, whatever your team has the capacity to create. So what content works? Uh, First Bank Financial Center, uh, they have a few campaigns that we'll talk about a little bit later on when they get more in depth about their, um, about their success stories, but I wanted to kind of call on Jeff and Heather first to talk about the Holly Days of Giving. Yeah, and I know we'll, we'll talk about how this comes to life on social near the end, but basically what Holidays of Giving uh, is is an annual program uh, that we execute in December where we collect nominations throughout all of our communities for individuals and charitable organizations that could use a little holiday cheer. And each branch gets to award a gift to an individual valued up to $500 and a check to a charitable organization for $500. We have uh, 14 branches to our footprint. So these, these uh, gifts are given uh, at, at each one. The, the photo you see there is a, a single mom with her, her two sons, and she actually nominated her older son there, Marco, um, because the younger son is, is battling cancer, and the older son has stepped up around the house, taking care of her, taking care of brother, and he had a birthday coming up, and all he wanted was a PlayStation 4. She couldn't afford to do it because of all the medical treatments that that younger brother is going through. So we were able to uh, make her wish for him come true, got him that PlayStation 4, and uh, it, it was just a really wonderful uh, afternoon here at the bank. That is really amazing, and it's a really great example of how uh, community involvement for banks is could be one of the biggest, uh, most successful content pieces that a bank could possibly do. So community, social responsibility, charities, charitable work, 
um, anything that just shows that you are actually part of that community, um, I think really personalizes the bank and uh, also has the extra added benefit of uh, creating really successful social media. So we'll get a little bit more uh, in the weeds with your success stories as we go along, but thanks, Jeff, for that. That's really great. Yep. So tip number five, develop a very basic social media strategy. So what we want to do here is educate first, sell second. Uh, and in fact, I would, I would probably wager that selling is um, probably not even, shouldn't even be in the mix at all, but we'll get, we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth later on. Post on a regular schedule. Uh, consider promoted posts and advertising, and then consider automation as well. So let's dive into this. Educate first, sell second. So a lot of the social networks, particularly Facebook, have gotten very serious about clickbait. Those are all of the posts that you see um, that say, oh, XYZ did this, you'll never believe it. Uh, that's what you call clickbait, and Facebook has started clamping down on that. Spammy links as well, which are links that take you to, that say they're going to take you one place, but actually ends up taking you to an advertisement or somewhere you didn't expect to go. And then there's the more than 20% promotional content. The rule basically is 80-20. 80% 80 80 educational and thought leadership, 20% promotional content, uh, which is something around uh, the bank or products or services that are, uh, that are available. And you really want to try to make that as minimal as possible. Uh, I'm going to let Heather talk about how they handle it at FDFC. Sure. So on uh, the FDFC social platforms, it's really rare you'll see us um, push a product out there. Um, however, we do announce new offerings that we have, so such as launching, you know, our online account opening, or just recently we actually posted an announcement around our instant issue debit cards. Um, this obviously varies by platform for us, but we try to stay away from pushing products out there and more keeping it community-based. And I think a key point there to what, to what Heather just said is that when we do mention things like instant issue debit cards or online account opening, it's really more so as a, an education on new conveniences or new enhancements for our customers. We're not asking them to, to buy something or trying to sell them on something new. These are things that can enhance what they're already doing with the bank and make their experience with us better. Great. So really a customer-focused approach rather than a hard sell. Absolutely. Right. So the next most uh, popular question I hear from clients is how often should I be posting? Uh, Gremlin social clients who are succeeding on social posts on average one to two times per day across at least two social networks. Now that's at the, uh, obviously that's going to be at the upper end of things. Uh, if you're just getting started or if you have uh, limited resources, maybe you're a one-man shop, then by all means, you can start posting. Just start posting one time a week on one network um, and then grow it from there. Uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint, so build as you go. And I think it's going to – I think it'll work out better if you try to start small and build rather than start trying to uh, boil the ocean, as I've said many times today, and – end up getting burned out or even worse, having uh, social networks that are just not managed and uh, go dark. So the best time to post on average, uh, I won't go into too much detail here because really it goes, it's different for everyone. You have to decide when your audience is most, um, is most likely to engage with your material, but you have to start somewhere. So in general, Posting on Facebook, weekends are great, uh, during the work week is great, uh, around lunchtime, and then af right after lunch, people are checking their Facebook pages. Twitter, pretty much the sky is the limit, but uh, Monday through Friday during business hours, and then uh, during afternoon drive, 5 to 6 p.m. on Wednesday. LinkedIn, uh, business hours, start at 7.30 in the morning and basically until 5 or 6 in the evening. Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays tend to get the most engagement. And then 10 to 11 on Tuesdays for some odd reason. People are just feeling very, uh, feeling very peckish on Tuesday mornings. And then Instagram, pretty much Monday through Thursday. Wednesday is a good day as well. After 10 p.m., maybe people are about to go to bed and they're checking their social networks one more time. Uh, 5 o'clock, though, on Wednesday seems to be the sweet spot. But, again, 
these are all just general times. You'll have to play around and see what works for your particular customer base. Social media advertising. Now, this may be something that you start getting into as you get a little bit uh, further down the road. Um, you can boost posts, you can make offers, you can create general ads. Facebook has so many targeting options for you. General ads uh, are a little bit different than boosted posts in that general ads, you can target almost down to the letter. Um, there, you can create these campaigns uh, to a specific audience based on location, behaviors, demographics, you can create custom audiences. Those you will use for very targeted campaigns. If you have, for example, maybe you're opening a new branch, um, maybe you're having a, opening a new line of business, maybe adding financial advisors, whatever it is, you can create a specific campaign and create a general ad and distribute it around Facebook. A boosted post is a really easy way just to boost your content, uh, to reach the people who like your page, to reach the their friends, friends of friends, for as little as $5. Uh, $5 a day, $20 for the week, it really depends on your budget. And you use that in promotion of special events. Again, maybe that new branch opening offers, uh, maybe the debit card that Jeff was talking about, company news, uh, blog posts, all of that great content that you're distributing, you can use promoted posts to boost those. Facebook offers, those are these are very short-term promotions. Maybe there is a a coupon, generally, if you want to, uh, you could have them bring it into the branch or uh, a coupon for, you know, $5 if you open a checking account. Uh, you just can click on the get offer. They can claim the coupon, bring it into the branch or via online uh, for promotion code. And that's usually good for sales promotions, special offers, and discounts as well. Twitter, pretty similar to Facebook. All of these are pretty similar. They all have their, their options for creating uh, advertising. Twitter promoted treats, tweets, deliver your messages to a targeted audience, and uh, you only pay if someone engages with that tweet. And then LinkedIn as well, they offer a way to target your specific audience, very similar to Facebook actually. Uh, use sponsored updates as well to feature your best news and content. So all of those options are available to you. Facebook, you'll probably often hear that uh, Facebook is now pay to play and that uh, brands don't get a lot of traffic from Facebook unless they pay for advertising. If your content is great, then you should have to really advertise very minimally. Uh, but you may want to start with building up your audience first and make sure it's people who are really engaged with your brand and want to be there and then start advertising. So our last tip, number six, don't forget about compliance. We haven't mentioned the C word yet today. Uh, keep your eye on security and rogue employees. So never share social network passwords with non-management employees. Um, that is critical. And then if you do happen to share a password with someone who, for whatever reason, leaves the bank, uh, if they quit or, um, heaven forbid, are, are terminated, you'll want to change those passwords every three months or after that person has left the bank. Create a social media policy with clear rules about posting uh, approved devices that people can use uh, to participate in social media and what you expect, uh, what is appropriate content for your bank. You'll want to go, go out and claim your brand name and handles on social networks. Now, earlier I mentioned that you don't feel, you don't feel that you need to be on each social network on each and every one of them, which is true. However, you may want to go out and still claim your brand name on those accounts, even if it's on Snapchat or Pinterest or some other network that you're not going to be using, go and claim your bank's name so that nobody else can sit on it. And so once you are ready, it'll be there for you. Otherwise, nobody can then uh, take it from you and pretend to be, uh, to be your brand. We call it brand jacking. And then finally, have response guidelines in place to deal with social media crises or a hack. Uh, know who is going to handle that crisis, what's the, uh, what's the line of, of duty there, who's going to respond, are you going to take it offline, are you going to respond publicly, are you going to delete those posts? These are all questions to ask in your response guidelines. So what are the risks for social media? 
this is probably uh, something else that's a little scary when uh, banks start thinking about having a social media strategy. There's the compliance and legal, uh, the laws and regulations for deposit and lending products, uh, complaints, reputation risk, of course, uh, bad PR, if somebody is posting negative uh, sentiments about your brand online, uh, how is that going to impact the bank? And then operational risk, which, of course, uh, we don't want any customer data getting away, uh, phishing, spoofing, hacking. Uh, all of those are very real risks when it comes to entering into social media and those third-party networks. So the key banking regulatory guidelines that we have to kind of mitigate some of that risk include governance. So you need to have people who are in place who have uh, who are accessing, controlling, and documenting all of your social media activity. Uh, have a social media policies and procedure in place. We just talked about that for everybody who is going to be participating in social media. Make sure that you have a policy in place that they have to read and understand before they participate in social media. You'll want to have some monitoring and oversight. You'll want to have a way to uh, check out your brand name online, any mentions of your brand name online, uh, on your social media account. On any account that you own, uh, you need to be able to monitor that and make sure that uh, nothing is being posted that could be uh, adverse for the bank. And then, of course, your risk management process. Are you going to have approval and workflow? workflow processes in place? Are you going to have someone maybe from the compliance department uh, monitoring or approving posts before they go out on your social media networks? Training for all employees. Uh, the FFIC says that you probably should train anybody who is going to be using social media and posting on behalf of the bank. And the reporting and archiving for auditing purposes. Should somebody come knocking uh, and wanting to see what your social ac media activity looks like, uh, you probably need to have uh, those archived posts and activity for at least uh, three to seven years. So understanding the regulations, this was interesting. We actually had a conversation with a, uh, a person from the FDIC, Elizabeth Khalil, and she actually penned the FFIEC guidance on social media use for banks. And some of her key takeaways uh, what I thought was were interesting, which is that they're not trying to discourage you from using social media. Uh, they know it's a, a great tool for financial institutions. It can allow you to reach out to your customers and spread your uh, get your brand awareness out there, deepen relationships with those customers, all of the things that banks say are important to them. And uh, basically, the FDIC says, yes, this is a good thing to be uh, to be doing if you're a financial institution. So don't have any fears around getting into social media. You just have to be mindful of some of the uh, regulations and some of the, uh, the rules and the safety nets that you have to have in place before you get started. So I wanted to uh, turn it over then to uh, Heather and Jeff again to kind of talk through uh, some of their fears. What was your biggest fear around compliance when you first started your social media strategy? So over our compliance department, I was just concerned of having the information out there with trigger terms or not having any of the disclosures or correct disclosures um, when needed. Um, so mostly it revolves for us around the compliance and legal issues. Um, so we currently are actually using Gremlin. So some of the top benefits that we've had from using that is the tool has allowed us overall to have the peace of mind um, that we are being compliant on our social sites. It's really allowed us an easy and seamless way to post while including our compliance team in the workflow. So anything I post um, goes to a member of our compliance team, she reviews it, reviews it and approves or makes a note on it for me. Um, it also has given us a way to have um, a handful of mortgage lenders um, present on social as well, um, which has been wonderful, which same for them. When they post, it goes out to the same woman on our compliance team, she reviews it and then approves or makes notes. Um, so it's been really great, a great tool for us overall, helping with that. Excellent, great, thank you so much. So Heather, while I've got you going here, I'm gonna uh, talk about your success stories a little bit and uh, help you guys go into a little deeper dive about your holidays of giving. We're gonna talk about two success stories. Uh, First Bank Financial Center has a really robust and really uh, great social media 
presence online, which is why we uh, we asked them to join us here today. So I wanted you guys to give a little deeper dive into some of your bigger successes on social. Sure. So our success with Holidays of Giving, uh, that campaign has been super successful for us on social media. Um, it's our third year doing it. Um, we feel the reason behind it is it connects us and puts us directly out in the community. So these posts also feature individuals in the community that others can relate to or people that they nominated. So many times we get those who know the particular individual or charity we post. So they share the post, they comment on the post, they like the post, which drives their friends to also see the post, like the post, comments on the post, and so on and so forth. So it really leads more traffic to the particular post um, and more people get to see our name. Um, so for example, the image you're seeing is um, the woman Jeff mentioned earlier named Ruth. Um, so FDSC took this photo during the surprise presentation. Um, we shared it. Um, and then Ruth shared it as well, which is the post you're seeing. Um, she mentioned, you know, how First Bank did this for her. Um, so her post then, you know, gained traction. Um, and overall, we received around 350 likes and 12 shares and a lot of comments on it. So that was really successful for us. Um, and as Jeff mentioned, um, there was about 14 individuals we did on social as well as 14 charities. So for the charities, we tag them in it so they can see it as well, which has been um, great because it lands on their page. Their customers can see it. So um, that's really great tra gained traction for us. Oh, that's great. So you did, you were tagging the other, uh, the other companies. That's a great idea as well. All right, so there's another success story that we were going to talk through. This one uh, I thought was really, really cute, and this is a contest. So this is kind of interesting, uh, the different kinds of content that uh, you guys are putting out there. We've got the community work with the holidays of giving, and now we uh, have a contest here. So tell us about this one. Yeah, this one's really fun, and we we actually developed this when we launched or relaunched our program. We wanted something that would uh, not only be engaging and fun for our followers, but get them, you know, to really seek us out uh, repeatedly and, and look for our posts. So um, we, we came up with Where's Mark Wednesday and literally developed bobbleheads of our CEO, Mark Moore. And we asked all of our employees, uh, even some of our customers, uh, to take a Mark Bobblehead with them on vacation, uh, on business trips, and, and take pictures of him somewhere uh, in the world. And then every Wednesday, Heather posts one of these pictures, and the first person to correctly guess where he is wins a $10 Visa gift card. So for basically $500 a year, um, we, we have a very engaging contest that, that you know, people look forward to and, and comment on and share with, with their friends. That's really cute. And for example, what's your average engagement on a post like this? Um, so it really varies week to week. So if we get someone that guesses right away, the engagement kind of goes down a little bit. But overall, we have a good, um, I would say about, I don't know, a couple guesses per week um, on each post. And then we will repost the post if no one guesses it that week. So um, I would say the ones that are a little bit more difficult get more engagement because more people are guessing. So. It varies week to week. Great. So the key takeaways from today's uh, webinar, social media marketing for banks requires strategic planning. No ready, fire, aim. But the thing is, that doesn't have to scare you. Uh, it can be very, very basic as you get started, and then you can build, build on that foundation as you move forward. Before you begin, set goals. Define your success metrics. Develop your team, develop a very basic content strategy, develop your social media strategy, and don't forget about your compliance rules. And then three, banks can be uh, successful on social with the right tools and planning, whether you have one person or whether you have 20 people. Uh, as Jeff said earlier, they have four. Either way, if you have a good plan in place and maybe even some automation on board, you can get this done in very little time each week, even if you're just a one-man shop. So that is going to wrap up the, uh, the content portion. I wanted to throw out that uh, we have an exclusive offer. If you're an ABA member, uh, Gremlin Brand Guardian is on the way next month. This is advanced brand monitoring for banks. We were talking about earlier 
how it's important to monitor your brand mission on uh, social and on the web. So Brand Guardian allows you to set up alerts and receive uh, notifications of those searches. You can filter those results. You can monitor what your competition is doing. And you can ar archive and capture those consumer content or those consumer comments on third-party sites. So again, that is free with ABA membership beginning in February. And if you want more information, you can visit info.gremlinsocial.com, keyword brand guardian. So thank you very much for attending today. I wanted to say thanks to Heather and Jeff from First Bank Financial Center. You guys have been great. And uh, Steve, if we have any questions, let's go ahead and dive in. Sure, I'll start off with the first one. Um, what are your thoughts of Facebook Facebook Live now? How does how does that impact risk? Oh, Facebook Live. So that is going to be you will have to come up with some kind of a strategy around Facebook Live because um, obviously it's live, and if you don't know what people are posting, you don't know who's going to be in the background or photo bombing. Um, so live video right now, even though that is is the rage live streaming, uh, you're definitely going to have to put into place some kind of a policy around how you want to handle that. Um, if the person handling your social media is the person, um, so yeah, some, there's going to have to be some, some kind of conversation between compliance and the person handling social media to, to decide whether or not live streaming is, is a place that you want to go. Okay, next question up, and this is pertaining to slide 23 around there. Where would video appear on the previous slide? And they're referencing page 23. Oh, choose the right network. So um, YouTube is video. Instagram has a platform for video as well. Twitter, pretty much all the social networks have some capacity for video these days. So uh, video, in fact, on that slide probably should be a little bit further as far as business value. Um, and I don't believe that it's terribly risky if you have something where you can edit and, and clean it up and distribute it without having uh, anything strange in the background. But again, you'll want to include that in your social media policy and you'll want to get compliance involved in that conversation to see where their comfort level lies with uh, any video taken by bank employees, uh, anything that's not strictly done in the marketing department and things like that. Okay, thank you. Next question up is, we use Vimeo instead of YouTube as just a platform to upload videos to share on other social channels. What are the pros and cons of using one over the other? Where do other community banks upload their videos? There's really no difference between Vimeo or, or YouTube. Um, what I would throw out there, however, is that when it comes to posting to social networks, they tend to give more weight to native video, and by that I mean if you take the actual working file, the MP4, or whatever format that you have it in, uh, I think I believe MP3, MP4 are probably the only ones supported by most of the networks, um, they give more credit to that. So for example, posting a YouTube video won't get as many eyes on as posting uh, your promotional content MP4, if that makes any sense. So really, uh, YouTube, Vimeo, any other platform, um, fine, either way, but if you can, if at all possible, use the actual file when you're uploading to the social media networks. Uh, Jeff and Heather, did you have any uh, feedback on what uh, platforms you use for video? You know, it's funny, we were actually talking amongst ourselves and had the same uh, feedback you just gave, so I think we were all on the same page there. Great. Okay, any next one up is, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, what? Oh, I was just asking if there's any other questions. Yeah, there's about uh, four more questions currently. All right. If you post pictures of customers and employees, do you have written permission to post? Do you have to get people to sign a release form? Are parents and children a little shy about having their pictures posted? Right. So you know, I'll say talking. just – Oh, oh I was going to say, you know, for ourselves, we, we have everybody sign a release form, uh, parents for their children and then adults for themselves. We don't post anything 
uh, either on social media or, or for our press releases that we send out for that matter. Uh, we have everybody sign a release form. We also have all of our employees sign release forms as well. Um, we and we are, are very aware of those employees who have not signed one. I think we have five who have not signed one. And we're very aware whenever we take photos at employee events to make sure that those individuals are not included in, in the photos. So it's absolutely something that we want to button up. Uh, people are, you know, obviously very concerned about their, their safety and security and, and, and that for their children as well. And we certainly wouldn't want to uh, put any employee or customer, for that matter, in a position they weren't comfortable with. Yeah, I don't think I can add to that, and, but I would uh, probably throw in the idea of tagging people in posts. Uh, which I don't believe you can actually tag an individual from a business page. Um, correct me if I'm wrong on that one, Jeff. Um, that you, just tag. you can so you can tag heaven. other companies. I said you can tag yeah. other companies on a Facebook post from your business um, Facebook page, but you cannot tag a particular individual. Right, right, right. So that's good. But when it comes to pictures and images like that, uh, just be be mindful of the tagging and also getting those uh, those releases signed. So that was a really great point, Jeff. Um, anything else? I know we're at the top of the hour here, Steve. Yep, we got a couple more, and uh, I'll just keep going. Okay. How does FBFC handle getting people to sign disclaimer? Oh, I'm sorry, that was kind of just covered there. What type of content do you focus on when sharing, making videos? Uh, Heather and Jeff, did you want to take a stab at that? Um, the content we generally post is we have um, some videos out there for the holidays of giving. Um, so we did our first year, we recorded some of the sessions as well as we've done um, some videos that are revolving around our customers. So um, some customer success stories as well. Um, we're just kind of starting to gain a little bit more on video ourselves. So we're looking to expand a little bit on that as well. Yeah, we will, and here at Gremlin, we handle it a little bit differently because uh, we're mostly B2B, but um, promotional videos, or even if you have, like I said, a long-form piece of content that lends itself to a 30-second video, um, those are really great to, to quick hits that you can put out there and gain some traction from as well. Okay, we've got two questions to go here currently. Um, this one is, do you need releases from businesses if they are in the background of photos? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I cannot answer that one uh, intelligently. Jeff, do you have any feedback on that? So um, I think it's the people that are in at in the photo um, from that business. We always get photo releases for. I don't know if you're asking if just like the logos in the background or if the people from the business. But um, if anyone that's in a photo, we always get a photo release for. But we do not get releases from, you know, a business owner whose business may be shown in the background as, you know, just a picture on the street and, and their business happens to be there. I'm not aware of anything that would require us to do so. Um, so we don't currently do that. Yeah, nor do we. So um, that, that might be something that we can look into and uh, maybe distribute some content on a little bit later on. What, uh, you know, depending on what businesses, I'm sure they don't mind because all, all press is good press, right? <laughs> but we'll find that one out. <laughs> good question. Okay, last question, Steve. Okay. Um, should you delete negative feedback on Facebook? So I'll start uh, with my feedback, and then uh, Jeff and Heather can talk about specifically what they do at their bank. My advice is always, wherever possible, don't delete negative feedback, but to publicly uh, confront it. And uh, it can be as simple as, uh, we're so sorry that you had this experience. Please contact X, Y, and Z, um, and we will try to take care of your issue. Um, the idea is to get that conversation offline as quickly as possible, and then maybe they have a phone call or an email with, um, with a customer service representative. Um, but in all, if, if at all possible, absolutely don't delete it, because it shows that you are responsive, and then hopefully, uh, once that person's issue has been resolved, they will be an advocate and come back and post uh, positive feedback. 
Uh, now, the downside of that, of course, would be if there's any profanity, uh, any kind of really serious, um, you know, just a nasty, nasty uh, comment that isn't uh, lending itself to any kind of productive resolution, then uh, sure, go ahead and delete that one. Jeff and Heather, how do you handle negative feedback? Uh, you know, I would absolutely agree with, with your sentiment. I mean, we, you know, certainly strive to, to uphold our, our customer service standards, but if somebody does have a, a concern or a negative comment, we really see it as an opportunity. For example, we had a, uh, a customer who complained on Facebook that our, our nearest branch was not nearest enough to her and wanted us to open a new branch. And, and we thanked her for being a customer and took the opportunity to talk about our online banking services and online bill pay and mobile deposit, all the ways that you can engage with us without having to come to a physical location. Um, so try and, and, and take that, that negative and turn it into a positive. And like you said, I think those that follow us and see us being responsive and, and see us solving people's problems, that just adds to to their positive perception of our of our brand overall. So yeah, unless a comment is, is profane or, or something like that, I would absolutely leave the comment up there and take it as, as an opportunity to to resolve somebody's problem and make their day. Awesome. Great. Well um, that is pretty much going to wrap things up for today. Thank you all. If we didn't get to any questions, then uh, we will make sure to, to reach out to you offline and try to get your questions answered. Thank you so much to Jeff and Heather today from First Bank Financial Center for joining us. Absolutely fantastic insight, you guys. Thank you yeah, for having like us. To... We appreciate it. Yeah, and I'd also like to note that we will be – yeah, we'll be distributing the, web, uh, the presentation to all attendees tomorrow, so we look forward to getting that. And I would like to thank today's speakers, Mickey Ware, Jeff McCarthy, and Heather Coltman for their informative presentation on Gremlin Social, the Banker's Guide to Strategic Social Media. If you have any further questions, please feel free to contact myself, Steve Plestock, here at the ABA at 202-663-5577. This concludes today's webinar, and have a pleasant afternoon. Thank you.